This is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. And now, Rebecca Larson. Welcome to the show. I'm Rebecca Larson, and this is the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. With this podcast, I share a variety of stories from the most well-known dynasty of them all, the Tudors. From simple stories about the people of the time to the drama that was the reign of Henry VIII. And of course, politics. This episode of the podcast is brought to you in part by The Falcon Nest, handmade history-themed jewelry. The Falcon Nest specializes in gorgeous replicas of the famous Anne Boleyn bee necklace. Now you can see more at the-falcon-nest.com. And be sure to use promo code TUDORSDYNASTY to receive 15% off. On today's show, I have special guest, historical fiction author of Jane the Queen and Path to Somerset, as well as host of Author Notes on the Tudor Radio Network, Janet Wortman. Janet is joining me to talk about my favorite subject, the Seymours, but in particular, Edward and Jane. Welcome to the show, Janet. Oh, it is wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me. You know, it's been nearly a year since I finished reading Path to Somerset, and it's been much longer since I read Jane the Queen, but both books that you wrote were so beautifully written. I applaud you. Thank you so much. I love hearing that. (laughs) (laughs) You know, Path to Somerset, I think, affected me the most of the two books um, because your take on Edward Seymour really opened my eyes to a different man than who I had imagined. To, To me, Edward was always the older brother who ruled his nephew, who was, of course, the king, Edward VI, and then had his brother executed. Because we disagree as to the version of events, we see it as more or less justified. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Now, you have been studying the Seymour family much longer than I have, and I would never claim to know more about them than you do. But as you know, I am a fan of Thomas, and I will immediately end this episode if you say anything bad about him. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> that, that's okay. I, I've, um, I have, you know, I, I'm not going to say modified, but I have softened uh, a lot of my um, descriptions of Thomas to try to really stick to the historical record. And you inspired that. Thank you. Aww. Oh, you have no idea how much that means to me. It's like, you know, <laughs> you try so hard to maybe make people's outlook of a certain Tudor character, you want to open their eyes and say, let's just really look at the evidence instead of what people have been trying to tell us for years. And, you know, uh, you know, it just feels good. It it does. Now, I am who I am, and I still believe the whole dog thing, but we don't have to talk about that here. (laughs) And that is, you know what, Janet, that is one of the parts of Thomas's story that I'm still a little torn on. Because I just, I I look at the accounts, but there just isn't, like, I I need more evidence to show me that he did this. So that's one of the things that I've been digging a little bit further into to hopefully get an answer for everybody at the end. To me, the truth is, is that I, outside of my fiction, I am willing to believe that maybe it was not Thomas himself who killed the dog. But the fact that somebody did kill the dog during that whole episode makes me believe that there was something nefarious going on. And mm-hmm. so for my fiction, it just makes so much of a better story if he did it. So, But, yeah. but we're, we're off the topic, and I apologize. I just <laughs> – No, you, it's me. I, I, I can talk about Thomas anytime. I can bring him into an Anne Boleyn conversation. <laughs> well, that, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I want to start off with some of the questions. So I always like to do a shout out on Facebook and ask everybody what questions they would like me to ask my guests. Mm -hmm. So the first question is actually from me. um, And I really would like to know what your impression of both Jane and Edward Seymour were prior to you researching about them. And then how did your opinion change after? I was originally Team Anne um, for a really long time. Um, And I was also Team Tom for a really long time. And then um, I ended up writing about the Seymours because I couldn't write about Anne Boleyn because I had this wonderful idea for this structure of uh, the secret diary of Anne Boleyn that that Elizabeth was going to read later. And it turns out that Robin Maxwell wrote my book before I got around to it. 
So I ended up um, moving over to the Seymours a little bit begrudgingly. But once I got there, my views really changed a lot. So within the last 10 years is when I really got my admiration and my love for Jane and Edward. That's awesome. I, I love that. I love that you were forced into learning about them because of Anne Boleyn. Kicking and screaming. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But they, they are such an interesting family to learn about. And I think, you know, you would agree that's what makes them so fun to write about. They are, the, the Seymour family is at the very center. I mean, it, it, it turned out I am absolutely thrilled with the way things worked out because I do believe that the Seymour family is at the center of the entire Tudor era. That's amazing. That is amazing. So as far as Jane goes, what do you believe was the most dominant force that shaped her character growing up? Um, I, I kind of struggled with this um, to write Jane the Queen. And I think one of the things that I came up with is that she and Anne Boleyn were cousins. And um, I adore my cousins, but I could see that in a, um, you know, kind of like a Tudor era family. I could see her being compared to Anne Boleyn all the time. You know, why can't you be more like your cousin? And, and Edward, too. Why can't you be more like George? Be mm. Just because that family really did seem to have so much more than the Seymours when you looked at them to begin with. Right. So I don't know if you ever read the book. It was called Fall of House of Queens. It was book one of the Shattered Rose series by Shelley Talcott. But the character of Jane in her book was quite the opposite of the meek and mild Jane that history has led us to believe. I have my own opinion on who I think Jane was. What's kind of your opinion? And have you checked out that book by any chance? I have not. But um, I'm writing it down, and I'm going to because I love to read that kind of stuff. I, I know a lot of people have this, was Jane meek or mild, or was she an evil manipulator? Or take out the word evil, let's just say manipulator. <laughs> um, and, and I don't think that we need to pigeonhole like that. I think that she was a little bit of both. I think that she was naturally meek and mild, but she was also really smart kind of saw how the game was played and then played it. So I'm I'm on a, a both and on, on this. I think that she really, her character was nuanced and she was able to be both. The question that always comes up is Jane's death. You know, we know that she had um, Edward VI and the reports have always been that she died of the purple fever, or childbed fever. Um, but if you've, you know, read Alison Ware's book, um, The Haunted Queen, she throws out some new um, new ideas about how Jane could have really died. And one of the things that came out on Facebook was that it seemed that 12 days was a long time for her to be sick with the fever. It must have been more. I, I don't know. I, I you know, I'm, I'm willing to, to stick with that. There's... Uh, yeah, I'm. Um, I'm sorry. This is just one of those issues where uh, I, I'm. Yeah, I'm. I'm sticking with the. I, I know that I'm kind of like an old school on this, but it, it's hard to get me to change my stories after a while. Sure. Um, it, it's kind of fun to hear new facts come in, but I'm sticking with the the corporal fever. But and it was so common back then. Like I don't know that it's not possible that she could have been sick for twelve days from that. You know, I'm assuming that not all cases are the same. But you know, I think in her book she talked about how Anne it was from food poisoning. You know, that eventually caused her death. We'll never know for sure. So it's one of that's always up for debates. It it could have been it, you know a contributing factor. I think it was just a lot of things. I don't know. I I really don't. What. <laughs> The only thing I do know is that she didn't make it. And um, it, it, it's a very vulnerable time right after you've given birth. And she had a really, really hard labor. So pretty much anything might have done it to her right. um, and caused her to um, just not be able to, to throw off whatever, whatever she caught. Mm. Now, when I put this question out, I even got some people asking um, their Jane or their Edward questions on Twitter, which doesn't happen very often. One of the questions that they were asking was about Jane's physical description. They're looking for a contemporary description. And was she considered unattractive? Um, yes, 
It, it kind of depends on the timing of the question. So during the days of Catherine of Aragon, I mean, Jane was your typical bonny English lass. And, and that was exactly what people aspired to be. She had very white skin and that was wonderful. Then along comes Anne Boleyn um, with her very different looks and, and, you know, her dark hair and different personality. And I think that that kind of changed what the fashion was um, so that Jane would have been seen as less attractive. And then, of course, she became queen and then she was gorgeous. Um, there, there was also the thing that um, I think it was Chapuis. And anytime you hear snark, um, it's probably Chapuis or, or Mariac. Um, but Chapuis said that um, making the comparison that when the, the, the richer the fabrics that Jane put on, the better she looked versus Anne Boleyn, who um, tended to look better in cheaper fabrics. So that was one of the things. Um, people have stated, oh, she was the fairest of all of Henry's wives. She definitely was, you know, if you want to use fair in terms of pale, then yes, um, she wins on that. And, and you can kind of expand the term fail, um, fair rather. People commented a lot on her um, on her personality, gentle, meek, simple, chaste. Um, Chapuis talked about her being of middling stature and very pale and not of much beauty. And that was right before she married the king and right before Chapuis came, became one of her best friends because of how wonderful she was to marry. So that that I think is the, the description we kind of have to go with. And you would have th thought that, you know, um, Chapuis, obviously, in my mind, wanted Jane to be queen because he could see that maybe it was a benefit to the princess or Lady Mary at the time. You think he would have said something a little bit more of flattering about this woman who is going to help, you know, the emperor's I cousin. <laughs> A little bit more between the lines, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, one of the people, one of the Seymour children um, has been reported as being, you know, very handsome. And, of course, I'm going to go back to Thomas Seymour. <laughs> but Sir Nicholas Throckmorton described Thomas as hardly wise and liberal, fierce in courage, courtly in fashion, in personage stately, in voice magnificent, but somewhat empty of matter. <laughs> I, I love that last part. Like, did you have to add that empty of matter? There? <laughs> so, of course, we know we know, you know, Thomas was attractive. Um, we have now discussed Jane's appearance. Um, how was their eldest brother, Edward, described? Dry, sour and opinionated. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> it just gets worse. It, it, it really does. Um I, I totally buy that, and you can kind of see the hint of that in The Path to Somerset, although we're, we're in his point of view, so obviously he doesn't see himself as dry, sour, and opinionated, but you kind of can tell he is. Um, in the, the, I'm writing The Boy King now, which is um, the, the third book in the trilogy. It's the story of Jane's son, Edward, um, as he comes to the throne, and in that one, you definitely get the dry, sour, and opinionated, because we're in... Um, King Edward's point of view and, and not in Edward Seymour's. I'm really looking forward to that book, Janet. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't. I, Path to Somerset, I enjoyed so much. I, I like, I want to find time to read it again. I really liked what you did with Anne Stanhope. Yeah. You know, you gave me a fresh perspective on her. I've always looked at her as the wicked woman you know, but with your story, you really gave her a softer, um, wifely tone. You know, I didn't feel like she was as manipulative with her husband and the people around her um, when I read your book. They were married. They were um, they were each other's best allies. And so as between them, they were as warm, fuzzy as you could imagine, or, or at least in my view. I don't know what other people might have thought, and I, I think that other people might have kept the, the more snippy point of view, but I think they had a wonderful relationship. Do you by any chance think that Edward used his sister Jane's position for his own gain, or do you think that he really cared about her? Um, I think that that's another yes and situation. 
I don't know how much he cared about her when she was still 27 and unmarried and kind of weighting him down. But then, you know, I, I think that once Henry showed an interest, her charms became seen in a very different light. Um, and I, I do think they had a decent relationship before then. I do think they, they cared for each other. But I think that her being queen and her coming into her own changed her life and changed everybody else's. So I've, I've got to believe that, you know, he was ecstatic over that and, and very thankful. And I'm sure he was ecstatic when Jane gave birth to a son. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> As, <And the> son <laughs> lived. <laughs> right. So do you think if she had had a girl instead of a boy, do you think that would have affected Edward's ambitions at court? I'm sorry, you just blew my mind with that one. Um, a, a girl instead of a boy would have changed everything. So I, I'm, I'm just trying to like spin it out here. So she has a girl instead of a boy, and then she dies anyway. So Henry still goes through the Anne of Cleves, Catherine Howard, and Catherine Parr, but this time he doesn't have a male heir. He has the right to designate any heir who would he designate? He would not have designated the baby girl. You would never designate a six-year-old at your death. So it would have been someone else. Fitzroy was dead. Mm -hmm. Mary. Oh, my God. He would have. So you kind of wonder. You had the whole Surrey thing. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm spinning Right. Off. No, I love it. But Surrey was rumored to have a crush on Mary. And there was, um, but, but this might have been like completely made up stuff. And I'm trying to remember that this was one of those things, you know, when you just hear stories and you don't remember whether they were told by a reliable source, but people were talking about how Surrey had a crush on Mary and that the sonnets he wrote about the fair Geraldine were about Mary, except somebody else said, no, 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 they were about this other woman. If Mary married Surrey, that would have been, um, that would have kept Henry's blood, Tudor blood, on the throne and um, would have saved the country. So on that basis, that would have been completely different. The, the bottom line is, is that a girl instead of a boy, that would have been it for Edward Seymour. He might have been, um, he would have been Henry's brother-in-law and Henry would have been sad that Jane died, but I don't think that he would have been placed the way he was. It really, this is like uh, the basis for an, you know, an alternate history novel, isn't it? Completely. Oh my goodness. This is the biggest, this is the biggest one of all. I used to think that, oh, what if Henry Fitzroy had lived or what if Arthur had lived? <laughs> this is the biggest one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So nobody can steal this idea. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. Well, so in answering that question, you actually answered my next one. So I will move on. So now that we talked about Jane and Edward, I want to kind of change topic a little bit, because while I was doing some research for this episode, I stumbled upon the Lady Mary Seymour's Wikipedia page. So the daughter of Thomas Seymour and Catherine Parr. I found something interesting on there that I wanted to kind of bring up and talk to you and see if you know anything about it. It wasn't sourced, so that's why I'm asking, because when it's not sourced on Wikipedia, everybody should know, do some research, make sure that it's true. <laughs> but what it said was that there was a lozenge-shaped ring inscribed, quote, what I have, I hold. And it was reputed to have been an early gift to Thomas Seymour by his brother Edward and was passed down through generations of the Seymour hearts until at least 1927. Janet, have you heard about this? Vaguely, very vaguely. Yes. Um, what I, what, what I remember was it was based on a revelations quote, which would, would make a, a lot of sense the, the I am coming soon, hold fast to what you have so that no one will take away your crown. Um, I don't know how that would have played out, but the idea that Edward gave it to Tom, I almost feel like it might have been something that Tom gave to Edward. Uh, I don't know. No, Edward, I have no idea. I, I, I think it is a fascinating thing. And I, most important, I think that it shows that the brothers really did have a good relationship for a long time until Edward VI came to the throne and Thomas was not given 
the credit and the honor that he, I believe he thought he deserved. Um, and, and I see the ring as just part of that heart wrenching history between the brothers. I, I, I don't know enough about it to really talk with you about it well, but I, it's a wonderful story. I so wish I could go back in time and find out what kind of relationship Thomas and Edward really had and, and watch it progress over the years and see how it changed. Cause I feel like it would answer so many questions for us. <laughs> It really would. <laughs> <laughs> really, really. Uh, Janet, oh my gosh, thank you so much for joining me today to talk about my favorite family from Tudor Courts. Mine too. Um, why don't you let everybody know how and where they can buy your books? Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble, Suddenly Castle. Amazon is probably the easiest, paperback and, and Kindle. Um, and they should also follow my blog. And, oh, and listen to my radio show. It's basically just all Tudor all the time with me, as I I suspect it is with you as well. Janet, you know, you just quickly mentioned, and before I let you go, you mentioned the um, Tudor Radio Network. Can Mm -hmm. you let everybody know about your show? Okay, my show is called Author Notes, um, and it's about writing the Tudors. Um, I love um, talking about how people tell the different stories and I'm looking forward to having you on at at some point um, to to talk about how you made the choices you did for um, when when you do come out with your your fiction of Tom Seymour or or your nonfiction. It's really the idea originally was that I wanted to talk about the stuff that got mentioned in the author notes, the times that authors um, massage the story a little bit, uh, massage the history a little bit to to improve the story. Um, But it kind of expanded from there to all of the choices that we make in deciding what pieces to include and and how to present a story. Oh, that sounds like fun. The Tudor Radio Network is free for everybody to listen to, correct? Absolutely. Just it, It's a wonderful thing. You can just put it on in the background. There is um, a lot of the programming is wonderful music, so you, you can literally keep it on all the time and, and just keep yourself in, in <laughs> 500 years ago as, as you go around about your day. I lo- I'd like to have it playing in the background when I'm at work. That music yeah. is so beautiful. Nice and quiet, and, and it works. Yeah. Janet, thank you so much again for being on the show. Thank you for having me. This is, this is you know, fun. This episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast was brought to you in part by The Falcon Nest, handmade history-themed jewelry. The Falcon Nest specializes in gorgeous replicas of that famous Anne Boleyn bee necklace. See more at the-falcon-nest.com. And be sure to remember to use promo code Tudor's Dynasty to receive 15% off. Thanks for checking out the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Read more. Read more on the blog at TudorsDynasty.com. Follow Tudor's Dynasty on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Subscribe to Tudor's Dynasty on iTunes. Thanks for listening.